the quantum drive, a controversial new propulsion system based on the idea of quantized inertia, was launched into space for a test in November. Testing was supposed to start early February, but it didn't quite go as planned. Let's have a look. On November 11th, a prototype of the quantum drive was shot into space as one of 80 small satellite missions aboard a SpaceX rocket. The device was produced by the company IVO Limited and the satellite called Barry One was built by Rogue Space Systems. Before I say anything more, I have to admit that I find it amazing how far private spaceflight has come. Basically, anyone with sufficient enthusiasm and finances can now put their stuff into Earth's orbit. However, for this particular mission, the trouble began pretty much as soon as the thing was launched into space. According to Rogue Space Systems, the satellite had power supply issues from the moment it got into orbit and by February 9th, the company had entirely lost contact with its satellite. This happened just before the quantum drive was supposed to boost the satellite to test the propulsion capacity of the revolutionary new device. So we still don't know if it works. Also, one more piece of space junk up there. Here's the background story. The quantum drive was thought up by Richard Mansell based on the idea of quantized inertia. Catchy name, but unfortunately every physicist I know who ever looked at the papers about quantized inertia has said it's pseudoscientific nonsense. I looked at the papers myself and I agree. I'm sure this video would do much better if I said I think it's correct and quantum something will propel us to the stars. But the truth is often boring and I'm afraid the truth is that the quantum drive is nonsense, though the reason it's nonsense is interesting in itself. As far as I can tell, the origin of the supposed new propulsion is unreal radiation. Unruh radiation is named after Bill Unruh, who calculated what an eternally accelerated observer would experience in vacuum. Naively, you'd think vacuum is vacuum is vacuum. What's there to ask? But Unruh found that an accelerated observer wouldn't see a vacuum. He'd instead measure radiation with a temperature that's proportional to the acceleration. So higher acceleration, higher temperature. You see, what physicists mean by vacuum is the absence of particles. That's how it's defined, just mathematically. Unruh now said that the notion of a particle depends on the acceleration. This means that what's vacuum for someone who sits still is not vacuum for someone who accelerates. Hence, the accelerated observer sees particles. We've heard that in Einstein's theory, the passage of time depends on how much you accelerate, and little Albert is comfortable with that. But Anru says it's the same for particles. How many you see depends on how much you accelerate, and Albert isn't really sure what to make of this. Where does the energy of those particles come from that the accelerated observer sees? They come from whatever causes the acceleration. You can't have an accelerated observer without a force, and for that force you need energy. You know, a propulsion system. The unreal radiation is basically something like a universal friction. It's a response to that acceleration. That already tells you that you can't use unreal radiation to increase acceleration. That doesn't make any sense. It'd be creating energy out of nothing. And that's leaving aside that the Unruh effect is ridiculously small, which is why it's never been measured. Okay, but to get back to the quantized inertia. The theory of quantized inertia was first proposed in 2007 by Mike McCulloch, a lecturer at the University of Plymouth. He wanted it to explain the pioneer anomaly and be an alternative to dark matter. The Pioneer Anomaly was an unexpected acceleration of the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft on their way out of the solar system. In 2012, NASA found the acceleration was due to an uneven emission of heat. So much about that. Regarding dark matter, McCulloch's thinking seems to have been basically that the effect of dark matter looks like there's acceleration missing. For example, because stars in the outermost regions of galaxies seem to be going around too fast. 
So I guess he thought if something is causing this extra acceleration, maybe we can use this to accelerate something else. This sounds superficially plausible, but if you think about it a bit longer, it doesn't make sense. The effect we observe in galaxies gets stronger the further away you are from the center of the galaxy. And while there should still be a small effect where we are, we know what it does. It keeps our solar system on its path around the center of the galaxy. It doesn't accelerate rockets. So I find this so-called quantum drive unpromising, to put it mildly. But I do find it fascinating that something that's so obviously nonsense got so far. Most interestingly, it's received financial support from DARPA, that's the American Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Reportedly, they put $1.3 million into the idea. Now, on the one hand, you might say 1.3 million isn't all that much. If that's something you might say, please get in touch. I have a research proposal for you. On the other hand, money is money, and they could have used it to say, pay the electricity bill of their new AI that I'm sure they're cooking up. So why didn't they? I think what's going on there is a total lack of respect for theory development. The people who hand out these grants probably think that theories are all nonsense anyway and just don't discriminate between them. This isn't the only example of this type. There was also the hollow meter, a proposal by Craig Hogan that Formula pumped two million into because he said it had showed that the universe is a hologram. Hogan didn't have a theory to back up his claim, and I'm not saying this to be annoying. It's what he said himself. And you know what? He didn't find any evidence that the universe is a hologram. Making robust predictions for experiments requires serious theoretical work. Unfortunately, I have to admit that physicists haven't inspired much confidence in the past decades by producing loads of theories about stuff that doesn't exist, that also doesn't get found. I can't even blame DARPA and Fermilab for concluding that it doesn't really matter if physicists say the theory is sound, because physicists have totally ruined trust in their entire discipline. But speaking of sound theories, just among you and I, I don't think the Unruh effect is a real effect, though I've given up fighting this fight with physicists. Most physicists seem to believe it's a real effect. I think they're using a meaningless definition of particle. You know, this makes me think now that maybe I should write a paper about this. The great thing about physics is that it makes the simplest things mind-bogglingly complicated. Take space. What is it? Well, space is whatever's between here and there, not that complicated. But, but, physicists say, space should have quantum properties. Space itself might be both here and there. And what the heck does this mean? Well, no one knows so much about the theory, but we also have experiments in physics. And this new experiment, which I just read about the other day, brought us a step closer to figuring out what space is. Or did it? Let's have a look. This video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. Time is what prevents everything from happening at once, as John Wheeler put it. And according to John Barrow, space is what prevents everything from happening in Cambridge. I'm just back from a trip to Cambridge, and for all I can tell, the only thing that happens there is rain. But let's not make things more complicated than they need to be. Both Johns were referring to space and time in Einstein's good old-fashioned theories. Einstein developed his theories before quantum mechanics ruined everything, and this is why they don't contain stuff like the uncertainty principle or dead and alive cats. In Einstein's theory, space and time are coordinate grids, basically. They tell you when and where things happen, like rain in Cambridge on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You get the idea. Einstein also told us, however, that space and time react to matter inside by curving. Trouble is that this responsiveness of space-time doesn't sit well with quantum physics. Not at all. The issue is that, according to quantum physics, particles can be in two places at the same time. And particles have masses that curve space-time. So where do they curve space-time if they're in two places? 
Quantum mechanics doesn't tell us because it knows nothing about the curvature of space-time. And Einstein's theory can't tell us because it knows nothing about quantum physics. What we do know, though, is that the way that space works in Einstein's theory can't be right, because somehow we need to account for those particles which can be in two places at once. To sort this out, we need a theory in which space can be in two places at the same time, which makes no sense. And that basically is the problem. Since gravity is just the curvature of space and time, a theory that gives them quantum properties is also a theory of quantum gravity. Now, I've worked on quantum gravity after I finished my PhD 20 years ago. Back then, everyone kept telling me that quantum gravity is basically philosophy because it doesn't have any measurable consequences. That's because gravity is an incredibly weak force compared to the other forces. Think about it. If you pin a magnet to your fridge, then the magnetic force of that tiny thing is stronger than the gravitational pull of the entire planet. And the forces inside atomic nuclei are even stronger. That's why nuclei stick together and good thing that they do. And so the story went, we can't test the quantum properties of space that would require enormously high energies, a particle collider the size of the Milky Way. That's a common estimate. But I've tried to tell people that makes no sense. Gravity is different from all those forces because it can add up. It doesn't neutralize like all the other forces do. That's why we experience it so prominently in daily life. To measure quantum gravitational effects, you just have to measure the quantum properties of objects that are heavy enough. I no longer work in the field. That's a long story. But I'm super excited to see that there are now several experimental groups trying to test quantum gravity and not with Milky Way size colliders, but in the laboratory. This then brings me to the new experiment, because they found a new way to measure very small gravitational forces. You see, the issue is that if you take elementary particles like those in the standard model, electrons, quarks, muons and all our best friends, their gravitational pull is so tiny we can't measure it, so you can't test quantum gravity with them. If you take something heavy, like a planet, then you can measure the gravitational field all right, but you can't measure its quantum properties. That's because normally quantum properties go away the larger the object, unless you treat them very, very carefully. And that's what they did in this experiment. They put a tiny magnet about the weight of a milligram into a superconducting container, which is cooled to near absolute zero. That superconducting container generates a magnetic field and that keeps the magnet trapped. It levitates on the container and because it's so carefully isolated, it can do quantum things like being in two places at once. Have a look at their experiment. It looks a little like the quantum computers at Google and IBM, doesn't it? These different levels you see here are all noise buffers with these tubes belonging to the different stages of cooling. Then they take a fairly heavy weight of about 2.4 kilogram, put it on a wheel, rotate the wheel and move it from one side to the other of this container with the levitating magnet. The thing is now that the gravitational pull from the moving weight should affect the levitating magnet. This will make the tiny magnet swing relative to the container with the frequency that depends on the position of the wheel. And that they can measure because it creates a current for which they have a super sensitive detector in the container. The reason they put this weight on a wheel is that this way they know the effect must come with a particular frequency and that makes it easier to identify. It stands out against the noise basically. And what you can see here is that the motion of the magnet indeed results response to the wheel being moved. The force that they measured was a tiny 30 atto newton. That's not the smallest force ever measured. And that also brings me to the question, what do you want to do with it? Remember that what we want to know is what the quantum properties of space and time are. For this, you need to measure the gravitational field of an object in a superposition of two places. But this is not what this experiment measures. It measures the gravitational field of the heavy weight with a quantum sensor, that's the levitating magnet. This isn't what you want to measure to test quantum gravity. 
Yes, it's something with quantum and something with gravity, but that doesn't mean it's quantum gravity. However, one thing that you can do instead of directly measuring the gravitational pull of a quantum object is to measure the effect of the gravitational pull of two quantum objects on each other. In a setup like this, that basically becomes a question of how the thing responds to vibrations but I'm not sure how you'd extract quantum gravitational effects from that. So I still think that the best approach is that pursued by the group of Marcus Aspermeyer in Vienna, which tries to directly measure the gravitational pull of small quantum objects by bringing microscopic sensors as close to these objects as possible. Then again, it's good to have a variety of experiments and whatever they'll do next, I'll let you know, so stay tuned. Oh yes, and subscribe. I'm not doing this YouTube thing right, am I? Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. A few weeks ago, I made a video on climate sensitivity, explaining why I'm worried about it. There have now been a few reactions by climate scientists. I'd like to briefly comment on that and add something which I took out of the first video. Just a brief recap of what we're talking about. The climate sensitivity is a model parameter that tells you how much the global average temperature changes in response to an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's the most important number to determine how quickly climate change will get worse. I should more precisely say that this parameter is called the equilibrium climate sensitivity because there are several sensitivities in climate science and not all of them are model parameters. The issue I was talking about in my previous video is that this climate sensitivity might be much higher than the IPCC uncertainty range suggests and therefore also higher than most plans to mitigate climate change assume. And I feel that given the relevance of this possibility, it's been very underreported. What's happened is that a few years ago, some of the world's best models began to produce a much higher climate sensitivity than the average of the previous climate models. After that, climate scientists argued that these models are unreliable and their predictions should be given a lower weight in the IPCC assessments. They dubbed it the hot models problem and I found it both funny and concerning that the double meaning didn't occur to me until a friend pointed it out. Now, the reactions of climate scientists to me saying the problem has been under reported have basically been two. First, doesn't matter what the climate sensitivity is, that's just distraction, we need to stop global warming anyway. And second, well, there are a lot of papers every year coming out with different climate sensitivities and one shouldn't pick one here or there. About the first point, doesn't really matter, it's bad either way. I think that climate scientists who say this have totally lost touch with reality. Governments make plans for reaching net zero based on expectations for how fast the situation will get worse. The climate sensitivity is super important for those plans. If you, and I'm talking to you climate scientists, get this number wrong, then all current plans will be grossly off. I really don't understand how you can just go and say it doesn't matter. You might as well go and say it doesn't matter what climate models predict in general. A particularly crude example comes from Ziki Hausfather and Andrew Dessler. Hausfather was one of the authors of the article in Nature magazine which coined the term hot models. In the blog post they write, arguments over the equilibrium climate sensitivity are distractions. Whether it's three or five degrees is a bit like whether a firing squad has six riflemen or ten. Someone's got to say it, so I will. That's a really bad comparison because the climate sensitivity does not tell you how big the problem is. It tells you how fast it'll become worse. Do you have to deal with six riflemen next year or do you have a century to think about how to deal with them? That's the question we're looking at. Now about the second point, there are always many papers. Yes, but this wasn't my point. The reason that Hausfather et al were going on about this is that the problem appeared 
not in any paper, but in some of the best climate models of the world. Models that are so good that climate scientists had previously decided to include them for the IPCC predictions. It was only after some models produced values that they didn't want to believe that they looked for a way to get rid of them. This is the problem I'm highlighting. It worries me because the same thing has happened many times in physics. A particularly stunning example is the lifetime of the neutron. The neutron is one of the constituents of the atomic nucleus. It's stable so long as it's inside the nucleus, but take it out and it decays in about 10 minutes. That's interesting in and of itself, but well, this is not a video about nuclear physics. The thing is that physicists have been measuring the lifetime of the neutron many times and updated the value. You can see the progression of the measurement results here. What you see is that the measurements seem to be comfortably sitting at some particular value, then they suddenly make a jump. It's not like the error bars just get smaller. They jump to outside the previous uncertainty region. Often this happens with new measurement methods and it means that physicists have systematically underestimated the uncertainty on their measurements. Even more amazing, this didn't happen for only one quantity. It happened for dozens of them. What's going on? Well, it's difficult to say exactly what happened there, but the explanation that sociologists have come up with is confirmation bias. A lot of people think confirmation bias means you only look at information that confirms your prior beliefs. But this isn't how it works, because you get information thrown at you whether you like that or not. The way that confirmation bias works is that if a finding doesn't agree with your prior beliefs, you think about it very hard and try to find something wrong with it. Whereas when it fits, you just accept it because it's what you said anyway. Way, so why think about it? In science, this shows up as follows. If you get a measurement result that doesn't fit with the previous ones, you're much more likely to look for a mistake than if it would fit. And this introduces a bias to confirm the previous finding. Physicists have learned from their past mistakes and now try to avoid this issue by deciding on a method of analysis before they even look at the data. Then they apply the analysis to the data blindly crunch the numbers and only then do they unblind the result and look at it. The result then gets published without further changes. But this is not what climate scientists have done, have they? They've changed their way of how they interpret the predictions of the models after some of them produced results that didn't fit their previous narrative. Clearly, the collaborations who work on the models with the high climate sensitivity think that they are the ones who got the physics right. So any such argument will have to weigh one type of evidence over another. It's a subjective assessment that masquerades as objective. The bottom line is that I believe the uncertainty of the climate sensitivity is much larger than the current IPCC projections make it look. And yes, I'm not a climate scientist, so you can try to dismiss my concerns by saying that I have a PhD in the wrong field. But I've seen how even large scientific communities reinforce their prior beliefs and arrive at the wrong conclusion, like the idea that the Large Hadron Collider would see supersymmetric particles. And I don't think that the community of climate scientists is immune to such problems. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. I had a prof who used to say that black holes can't exist because, quote, God wouldn't separate himself from part of his universe, end quote. Now, you might think that this question has been settled for good, what with all the evidence we have for black holes. Also, the prof has meanwhile died, and yes, his name was Greiner. But then again, science is never really settled, is it? And so today we have a press release saying not only that black holes aren't really black holes, but stars, but also that there might be stars within those stars. The press release comes with this image to make clear what we're talking about. What's on the surface of those stars? Is it uh, stars? I had a look at the paper. 
A black hole's defining property is the event horizon. That's the boundary of a region of space from which nothing can get out, not even light. Once something crosses the horizon, the only thing it can do is to fall towards the center of the black hole. Technically, mathematically, the center of the black hole has a singularity, and at that singularity, everything gets destroyed. You can check in any time, but you can never leave. But the horizon of a black hole is not a physical thing. It's just the boundary of a region. It's like city limits, basically. You don't even notice as you cross it until you get a speed ticket. A lot of people find this surprising, I believe, because they think there must be a strong space-time curvature. And indeed, one would notice a strong space-time curvature. This is because the curvature creates forces that tear things. However, the larger the black hole, the smaller these forces are at the horizon. They only get strong towards the singularity, where they'll eventually rip everything into pieces. So the thing is that at the black hole horizon, the forces can be very small and you wouldn't notice crossing it. Not until the singularity shreds you. Forget Venus flytraps, black holes are much meaner. But the issue is that since nothing gets out of a black hole, you can't directly observe it. The only evidence we have for black holes is indirect. You can study, for example, how stars move around it, how light bends around it, how gas heats up around it, what gravitational waves escape when it's formed, and so on. And in each of those cases, you can try to say, well, maybe it wasn't a black hole. Maybe it was something that looked very similar to a black hole, but really it neither had a horizon nor the singularity. Why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, there are people like my prof who just don't want to believe in black holes. Maybe not a good motivation, but scientists can be disappointingly human. Then there's the issue with the singularity that we don't know how to prevent. And then there's the problem with black hole information loss. Basically, black holes are trouble. And if you avoid black holes, you can avoid some trouble. So about 20 years ago, a team of physicists came up with an alternative to black holes that they call a gravastar. A gravastar is a supposed end state of gravitational collapse that is not a black hole. Instead, it's a thin shell that has dark energy inside. Exactly how this gravastar is supposed to form is somewhat unclear. There has been some talk of quantum effects, which basically means a miracle happens and then you get that gravastar. Another issue is that they're unstable if they rotate, which isn't good. But it's true that these gravastars are mathematically correct solutions of Einstein's equations, like black holes and wormholes, but without the horizon and without the singularity. That means they can't be all that easily discarded. And this finally brings me to the new paper. The authors of the new paper point out that there isn't just one type of gravastar, but that if you believe that these things exist at all, the same process can happen multiple times, forming shells within shells within shells. And interestingly enough, this makes the gravastars more stable. I think this means the other way around, that the inner shells could be caused by the instability of the outermost one, Though they don't discuss this in a paper, so take that with a grain of salt. And don't forget your beta blockers along with that. So this is a neat paper, and I'm pretty sure it's mathematically correct. But I think it needs some context. First of all, maths or not, we have some observational evidence that's difficult to make compatible with the idea of gravistars. That's because astrophysicists can study how gas and stuff falls into a black hole. If these objects had a surface like these gravistars do, you'd expect to see signs of an impact of sorts, but there isn't one. Then again, you can make up some story about the surface of these gravistars, which prevents this, like them being good at absorbing things, and maybe then it works. The other issue is that we have some observations of gravitational waves that have been attributed to mergers of black holes. And if you do the calculation with gravistars, it just doesn't fit with observations. This argument, interestingly enough, comes from one of the authors of the new paper. 
I had another prof who used to say you always need to make two predictions, one for the thing you believe in and one for the exact opposite. That way you can't be wrong. I used to think he was joking, but now I'm not so sure. In any case, to understand what's going on with this paper, you need to know that Einstein's theory of general relativity is mathematically extremely interesting. Physicists just like finding new solutions to these equations. I've been looking for solutions of the equations myself, and I can report from personal experience that this can become quite addictive. It's really hard to find these solutions. And this means if you find a new one, you can almost always get it published. The journal to do that is Classical and Quantum Gravity. This is where the new paper was published. And this is also where my paper appeared before I slapped my hands asking, Zabina, what are you doing? The issue is that it's often unclear what these solutions have to do with reality, if anything. And this is the case with the stars within stars. Are they solutions to Einstein's equations? Yes. Does that mean they actually exist? No. We've seen a lot of headlines in the past year saying there are things in the universe that supposedly shouldn't exist. You may have been wondering how many things can astrophysicists possibly find that supposedly shouldn't exist until concluding that maybe something is wrong with their ideas of what should exist in the first place. Yes, I've been wondering about this too. And in this episode, I want to explain why I think these headlines keep appearing and why I'm pretty sure they'll continue to keep appearing. These objects that supposedly shouldn't exist aren't all of the same type, so let's first have a closer look at what we're talking about. We have black holes that are too heavy, galaxies in the early universe that got too large too quickly, galaxy clusters that are too large after a collision, structures larger than galaxy clusters which never should have formed, and then every once in a while there's a galaxy that's too dark or too small or faint or whatever. But most of the things that shouldn't exist seem to be issues of being too big. It's like the universe has its own obesity problem. The reason for why the headlines say these objects shouldn't exist is, well, that it's a catchy headline. And yes, of course, I've done it myself. But the scientific reason is that astrophysicists had predictions for what they expected to find. And those predictions didn't pan out. So if they have all these many predictions that turned out to be wrong, why aren't they panicking? Why aren't there any paradigms shifting to use Kuhn's expression? The first thing that might spring to your mind is that astrophysics is a peculiar research area because we can't carry out experiments. We can only observe what has happened. And yes, that puts limits to what we can do. But as a scientific discipline, astrophysics isn't unique in this regard. If you're digging up dinosaur bones, it's a similar story, except possibly that dinosaur bones tend to not go supernova, which is a shame, really. So yes, this is one of the reasons why astrophysics is much more difficult than, say, particle physics, where we can make dedicated experiments. But there is another reason that makes astrophysics more difficult than particle physics. It's that it deals with very big objects, stars, black holes, galaxies, galaxy clusters, the entire universe. And these objects are dramatically more complicated than the small individual particles that we deal with in particle physics. You see, the protons in your body and the protons in my body are, for all we currently know, identical, except for their location. I could swap out my protons with yours and it wouldn't make any difference. But galaxies are not elementary particles. Yes, galaxies come in different types like spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies and dwarf galaxies and so on. But no two galaxies are really alike. They were born at different times in different locations. They have different stars and a different gas content. They came about by different mergers and have undergone different collisions and live in a different neighborhood each galaxy is unique. In some sense, I think, and I hope astrophysicists will forgive me for saying that, the problem with astrophysics is similar to the problem with sociology. 
In sociology, study results depend on who asks what and how at which time and whether the study participants already had lunch and what the result of the football game the night before was and so on. That's to say, if you wanted to understand sociology, you'd need to keep track of a lot of parameters which are currently just not captured in the literature. You also have this in medicine and biology when they use animal models, as they now put it. But animals aren't models, they're living creatures. Whether a mouse is doing well can depend on all kinds of things. How much sunlight they get, how big the cages are, whether their human caregivers talk to them, whether they see their compatriots dying and God knows what else. If you wanted to make sense of the mouse model data, you'd have to keep track of all sorts of things that currently aren't being kept track of. And that's why in sociology and biology, it's so difficult to draw conclusions from conflicting studies. And that returns me to astrophysics, because in astrophysics, it's a similar story. In most of the analyses for the things that supposedly don't exist, the issue is that it's not clear what the observations say to begin with. There's just too much information missing. A typical problem in astrophysics is, for example, that there are hundreds or so of telescopes that have scanned this or that part of the sky or this or that era. But every telescope is different. How much you can see with it and how well you can see it depends on the telescope. The data in and of itself can't be interpreted without knowing how it was collected. There's also the issue, as we've discussed in an earlier episode, that sometimes the data analysis already contains assumptions about the theoretical model. If you take, for example, the issue of the galaxies that got big too fast, you might ask, how do we really know how old they are? Basically, in astrophysics, if you want to compare the predictions with observations, you have a lot of ingredients. On the one side, you have the theory that you want to test. From that, you create a model for the situation at hand, say a galaxy. Then you use a computer simulation and make a prediction. On the other side, you have the observations themselves, the instrumental bias, the data analysis, and then you compare that to the prediction. And the thing is now that throwing out the underlying theory is the last resort. Scientists will first look for problems with all of the other ingredients, the observations, the instrumental bias, the data analysis, the model, the computer simulation. And this, I think, is why there's so much discussion in astrophysics that isn't going anywhere. Each time someone says, this thing shouldn't exist, someone else says, reasonably enough, actually, we can't tell because we don't know this, or we haven't observed that, or our computer simulation is missing that, and so on. That's a pretty bad situation because it prevents the field from making progress. It's very clear that something's wrong because, you know, it isn't good if predictions constantly disagree with observations. But I really think astrophysicists need to consolidate their data and maybe get a bit more serious about making predictions. But since I don't actually think they'll listen to what I say, I predict that we'll see more headlines about things that supposedly shouldn't exist. Last week, we had bad news for quantum computing. This week, we have the most excellent good news. Thanks for living with me through the ups and downs. The news is that physicists have reached a new record for building a quantum computer out of single atoms. They've now made it to more than 1,000 atoms, and they say their method can be scaled up quickly. Let's have a look. The story of quantum computing is a big drama. The major reason is that it's incredibly difficult to judge the promise of this new technology. In the past decade, there have been hundreds of startups who have tried their hands on getting quantum computing to work. The biggest players on the market have so far been Google, IBM, Honeywell and INQ. They all bet on specific types of quantum bits, qubits for shorts. These qubits are the physical basis of the quantum computer, and the so far most widely used ones, which the big players have used, are superconducting circuits and ion traps. 
The new paper is about an entirely different approach to create qubits called atoms in tweezers. The tweezers themselves are actually not made of atoms, they're made of light. They basically trap atoms with lasers and then poke them with more lasers. Yes, most of current physics is basically poking things with lasers. Physicists really, really like lasers. Atoms and tweezers have been catching up very quickly with the approaches pursued by Google and IBM. Why superconducting circuits and ion traps have a big starting advantage in being fairly easy to produce and operate, they're difficult to scale up. Scaling up quantum computers doesn't just mean you lump together more qubits. This isn't all that difficult. The difficulty is that you still have to be able to control and read out all the qubits individually. The nice thing about working with individual atoms is that they're small and electrically neutral, so they don't influence each other so much. You can encode information in the atoms, for example, by using spin states. This is how you get the quantum bits. But one of the biggest challenges of putting atoms into tweezers has been to get sufficiently many of them into the same trap. In the new work, they solve this problem in a clever way by using a microlens array. That's basically what the name says. It's a tiny plate with even tinier lenses on it. The entire thing is less than a square millimeter. You shine with the laser on it and that creates a regular array of dots. They use two of these arrays, shine two lasers on them, and then overlay them so that the second layer pushes the atoms into the traps of the first. They call this supercharging. And look how lovely the atoms sit there in the array. Isn't this amazing? These are images taken under fluorescent light. Each dot is an atom. They managed to trap more than 1,000 atoms in this array with regular clusters exceeding 400. Now, let me be clear that they didn't actually calculate anything with these atoms, but in principle, they know how to do it. Yes, it's more lasers. If they managed to calculate with these atoms, then in terms of quantum bits, that'd be competitive with IBM's biggest chip, which just reached the 100 qubits threshold a few months ago. But wait, this isn't it with the good news. They say that with these microlens arrays, they can in principle scale the setting up to 100,000 atoms. This still falls short of the 1 million or so where the first commercially relevant applications for quantum computing could begin, but that'd be getting really close. So yes, the hype around quantum computers is thick, with some people claiming that they'll bring a new industrial revolution and change the world. But the reason quantum computing news is such a roller coaster is that it isn't all hype. There's real promise there. First and most importantly, quantum computers don't rely on any speculative new theory. They're just normal quantum physics. But what's normal for quantum physics isn't normal for us. Because quantum things have a very strong form of correlation. That's the entanglement. You can't do this on a conventional computer. And this entanglement is why a quantum computer can do some calculations faster than a conventional computer. Or rather, I should say, the calculations don't get slowed down that much on a quantum computer when problems become larger. You see, suppose you want to figure out how to optimize your financial assets, what to buy, what to sell. Well, the more stocks you take into account and the more details you want to be in your model, the more difficult the calculation gets and the longer it takes. This is the case both for a conventional and a quantum computer. But on the conventional computer, the computation slows down much more. So for big enough problems, the quantum computer will win eventually. And for banks, that means money, a lot of money. This is why the head of Bank of America said that quantum computing would be bigger than fire. It'd be a computational advantage that converts right into money. But the issue is that this crossover point where a quantum computer outperforms a conventional computer doesn't just depend on the fundamental laws of physics. It depends on how good your conventional computer is and how good its algorithm is. And on the other hand, it also depends on the algorithm on the quantum computer and how fast you can operate the quantum bits. Also depends on how good your press department is in claiming you've done something interesting. 
And this is why there's so much argument about whether quantum computing is really the game changer it's been made out to be. Because artificial intelligence has much improved how quickly even conventional computers can solve some problems. And that's an increasingly large competition to quantum computers. Still, if a quantum computer would just be large enough, it would eventually outperform the conventional computer because that's a question of the scaling law and that's indeed due to fundamental physics. There's no doubt about it. No, you can't argue with the laws of nature. So today I'm super optimistic about the prospects of atoms and tweezers, but maybe next week I'll change my mind again, so don't forget to subscribe. Watching science videos is all well and fine, and I don't mean to complain you're doing it, but it's not a good way to actually learn something new. If you want to learn something new, you need to actively engage with the topic. A free and easy way to do this is on Brilliant.org, who've been sponsoring this video. On Brilliant, you find courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. I even have my own course there. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. And all their courses are interactive with visualizations and follow-up questions. Brilliant really makes learning easy, fun and also convenient because you can do it whenever and wherever you like. And you can now try it for free for 30 days by using our link brilliant.org slash Sabine. The first 200 of you to use this link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give science some understanding. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.